Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, once again. Nehemiah, chapter 9. And if you're watching our video on the internet, we're having some audio difficulties tonight. So uh, I'm trying to speak as loud as I can and trust that the mic built into the camera will be sufficient. Nehemiah chapter 9, and let's read verses 13 through 21 as we get started tonight. Nehemiah 9, and started verse 13. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and broughtest forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hadst sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly, and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, This is thy God, that brought thee up out of Egypt, and had wrought great provocations, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not. Uh, in the wilderness, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest them also a good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna, excuse me, thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, their clothes wax not old, and their feet swelled not. This is a, a rehearsal of Israel's history, particularly the wilderness journeys. And these events are described in detail back in Exodus 20, here are verses 13 and 14. Thou camest down also upon, upon Mount Sinai, he says, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, and also in Exodus 17, here, verse 15, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock. Also here, in verse 17, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. Look back with me to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13, and notice verse, starting at verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And verse 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And verses 3 and 4. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. And also look at Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. <coughs> Deuteronomy 17. Verses 14 through 16. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, 
and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. But the people thought life would be better had they not left Egypt, at least as servants to the king of Egypt, we knew what our day, what each day held. This idea of wandering in the wilderness, following a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, not knowing what each day is going to bring, how long we're going to journey, when the cloud is going to stop, when the, when the fire is going to stop, and we can set up camp once again, or how long we'll be there until it lifts up off the tabernacle and we have to pack up everything and start moving again. They didn't like that life. They thought things would be easier if they were to go back to Egyptian bondage. The 40 years mentioned in our text, verse 21, began counting there in Numbers 14 when they um, hesitated to enter Canaan. And it ran until Deuteronomy 1 and verse 3 after they had been wandering for the last 40 years. And as a special, a special note, uh, notice the hurdle which God places in our text for the Seventh-day Adventists to try to overcome. And that's verses 13 and 14. Let's read those again. Thou camest down also upon, upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. Also look forward at Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel 20, and notice there, verse uh, 12. Here God speaks to Ezekiel. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And also verse 20 there, he commands them, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Unlike the uh, moral commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, which is lying in other, other terms. The Sabbath was a ceremonial commandment, and it was given to the nation of Israel exclusively. It wasn't something commanded all men everywhere, as the Seventh-day Adventists will insist upon. I had a friend I worked with for many years. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. Decent fellow in many ways. We got to talking about some of these matters. We got to talking about the Sabbath day. And he said he firmly believed that worshiping on Sunday would be the enforced mark of the beast. And if you do so, that will mean that you've shown allegiance to the Antichrist and God will then reject you during the tribulation. That the Sabbath day, whether it's the first day or any other day, as opposed to the seventh day, will be the issue. And I said to him, the seventh day rest wasn't even recorded in the scriptures until 1500 B.C. by Moses. It was God revealing to Moses the story of the creation and uh, that's roughly 2,500 years after Genesis 1 and the events there. If you read Moses' account of the creation in six days and that God, quote, uh, rested on the seventh day, Genesis 2, verse 2, he never told man that he was supposed to rest 
every seven days. And yet the Adventists insist that God's commandment for men to rest on the seventh day began right there in Genesis chapter 2, the first week of creation. And I've read it many, many times. And I don't know how many times they've read it, but maybe they don't know how to read. That might be the problem with a lot of people. They don't know how to read. They assume and imagine that something is actually there in the text, but it says nothing of the kind. There's no language of, to that effect at all. And I said, and he mentioned that uh, what they'll do is they'll say that God commanded uh, the seventh, the um, uh, rested on the seventh day, Genesis two, and then he and he commanded all men to rest on the seventh day, uh, Exodus twenty, and they failed to mention that there is twenty five hundred years of history between those two texts, and when you point out the fact that nothing is said after the creation week of man being expected to rest every seventh day. That means one-third of the Bible's timeline happened without anybody knowing anything about resting on the seventh day. Adam and Eve didn't know about it. Cain, Abel didn't know about it. Noah, Shem, Japheth, Ham, they didn't know about it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, uh, Joseph, nobody knew anything about resting on the seventh day. How is it that something could be that vital from the beginning, and yet one-third of the Bible unfolded without anyone knowing anything about it? That's how you got to deal with some of these cults. They'll take a verse here, they'll take a verse over there, they'll, they'll put them together. They, in, in their mind, they think they're comparing Scripture with Scripture. No, they're looking for two verses that they think they can twist and rest to their own destruction, put them together, and hope that the person they're talking to is more ignorant of the Bible than they are. That way they can get away with their story. But one-third of the Bible's timeline took place, and nobody knew about the Sabbath day until it was made official in Exodus 20. Uh, just for balance, I want you to notice that the Lord God mentioned there in verse 14, who is said to be ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and so forth. God that has those qualities can still remove his kindness, according to Ezekiel chapter 16. He can forsake his mercies to the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 12 together will reveal that. He can consume and take vengeance on his enemies, according to Deuteronomy 32. And he says he will tear you in pieces, Psalm 50, verse 22, for rebelling and sinning against him. And he says he's going to laugh at some people's calamities, and he's going to mock when their fear comes, Proverbs 1, verse 27. And he will eventually cast you into a lake of fire, if you're an unbeliever, Revelation 20. And Christ said he would cast his enemies into a fiery furnace, Matthew chapter 13. If I went too fast with that list, see me afterwards and I'll slow down for you. We can talk privately. Now that's a balanced view of the God of the Bible. And a lot of people forget that. Too many modern day ministries want to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. A fellow um, sent me a text as I was, we were getting ready to leave the house and I was sitting in the car um, re responding to him when we got in the parking lot here. And he preaching on the sidewalk in New York, uh, passing out tracts. A lady came up to him and said she doesn't understand why the justice departments of the world and God uh, don't show a kindness and mercy and forgiveness to everyone, no matter what the circumstances. And uh, he didn't know how to respond to her, something that outrageous. She, apparently, she said to him, she thinks uh, no matter who it is, no matter what they've committed, God should be a God who welcomes everyone into heaven, even if it's the devil himself. 
and he didn't know how to respond. I just texted him a few minutes ago that a God who would, would be only love and only forgiveness would be a scripturally perverted God. And I said, when you find someone like that, ask them if they have any children of their own. If they say yes, then ask a second question, have you always let your children get away with anything they wanted to do? Or did you have certain rules, certain expectations, certain guidelines, certain principles, certain rules of conduct, and things that are basically right and wrong that everyone should acknowledge and respond to? Or do you let your own kids get away with everything and only forgive them and never set a rule, never set a boundary, never set any standards that you uh, want to impart to them? You can see the silliness of that kind of questioning, the kind of person, how hypocritical someone would be if they said yes to any of that, and yet expect God to let everybody, even if it's the devil himself, into heaven. I've heard ministers almost go that far, preaching uh, at funeral services during my day job, saying, I don't believe uh, any God would ever turn away any of his children when they wanted to come home. Who says everyone wants to come home? There are a lot of people who are looking forward to going to hell and having a big party and a big beer blast for eternity with all their friends. And half the country western music sings to that effect, or lyrics are written to that effect, and rock and some rock bands too. The idea that God should be all love and all mercy and all kindness and all forgiveness means that there, those words would have no meaning. Kindness would have absolutely no meaning if there was not also wrath or judgment or some standard, some barrier, some restriction on some people's actions. Love has no meaning unless there's also hate on the other side by which, against which you can measure it. And so God would only be uh, loving and kind and sweet and generous and compassionate and merciful and welcoming uh, have quality, qualities of those kinds, like Joel Osteen wants to preach, is a, spirit, is a perverted God. He's not the God of the Bible. And yet he's mistaken as being the God of the Bible. That's not true. Let's continue reading verses 22 through 27. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of, um, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. Their children also multipliedst thou as the stars of heaven, broughtest them into the land, concerning which thou hadst promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land. Thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, gave us them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. They took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells, dig, vineyards, and olive yards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought us great provocations. Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies, who vexed them in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. We'll stop there for tonight. On goes the repetition of their history. The first half of verse 22 is described in the book of Joshua, the, their initial conquest of the land of Canaan. And the second half, um, regarding Og, king of Bashan, and uh, Sihon, the king of... Uh, uh, what was he, the king? <laughs> Heshbon. Um, that's recorded later in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and also in Numbers chapter 21. 
And then in verses 23 to 27, they refer to the material recorded in Numbers 1 through 8 and Joshua 1 through 8, their dominion and the subjugating of all the people, the Canaanite tribes and the peoples in the land of promise at the time. And then he says at the end of verse 27, he gave us them saviors. It has nothing to do with spiritual salvation. Saviors there is used in the sense of uh, saving them from their military foes, their military enemies, right in the description of that verse, in that verse. Such men as Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, God raised up along the way to win victories against the Philistines, for example, Samson did, and delivered Israel once again out of the uh, domination of the Philistine peoples. And God did much the same thing uh, when he raised up King David years later against the Philistines. And God used King David as a military savior of the nation to fight numerous wars and battles against the uh, people in that land that God wanted to drive out and give that land to his uh, chosen people, the descendants of Abraham. So that when Solomon came along, Solomon was able to reign in peace. And of course, the name Solomon uh, comes from the word shalom, meaning peace. And the, the second half of Jerusalem, S-A-L-E-M, or the word Salem, which is also in the Bible, that's also derived from the same Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace. So Jerusalem means the city of peace. Although there's not a lot of peace in Jerusalem now, but, and nor has there ever been. It's always been contested. It's always been fought over since God gave it to the descendants of Abraham and the children of Israel. It's always been contested, uh, and even more so now since it's become a blossoming uh, breadbasket to so much the world and one of the most thriving nations in the modern world. That's why all the Arab peoples and the Middle East nations are jealous and envious of the Jew, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're jealous because they couldn't achieve in their own countries for over centuries of time what the Jewish nation has achieved in the last 80 years, 70 years. And so it's very telling uh, where God's blessing has been resting uh, for the last 70 some years since Israel was declared a modern state.